Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and we're back on this Monday with a story out of Phoenix, Arizona. On April 28, 29-year-old Lauren Hickey was having a pretty average morning. She had reached out to two of her friends for their morning ritual of telling each other why they were grateful that day. Lauren expressed in the text message conversation that she was thankful to wake up another day and that she could go get a coffee and go on a walk. Well, Lauren did follow through on her plans for that Friday, and she began hiking through the desert area in the northeastern part of Phoenix. Sadly, later that day, a welfare check was made at Lauren's home after a friend called police saying she had not come to work, and that was unusual for her. The following day, police found Lauren dead after a resident of a neighborhood adjacent to the hiking area reported seeing an injured person. Lauren had suffered 15 stab wounds to her upper body. Police found some of Lauren's belongings and one of her shoes scattered along the hiking path near a barbed wire fenced area. Along with those 15 stab wounds, Lauren had defensive wounds and small abrasions on her body that were most likely sustained as she was trying to maneuver through the barbed wire fence. Well, thank goodness for cameras because cameras in the area helped police gather evidence. One view showed Lauren walking alone on the path about 36 seconds later, a man wearing headphones appears on camera walking in the same direction. Then just 22 seconds later, Lauren leaves all the camera views and is headed towards the direction of where her body was later found. Well, just a few seconds later, the man in headphones begins sprinting towards Lauren. He then also leaves the view of the cameras. And then about a minute later, the suspect is seen again as he runs in the opposite direction before trying to cross the barbed wire fence. Police spent the next few days running tests on blood that was found on the discarded shoe. Those tests preliminarily identified the blood as belonging to 24-year-old Zion William Teasley. Well, armed with that information, police then pinged Teasley's cell phone, verifying that it had been in the area where Lauren was killed. Teasley was also identified by co-workers when they were shown the surveillance footage. Those associated with Teasley also said he carried a pocket knife. And Teasley's probation officer also identified the headphones the man was wearing in the camera footage as the same brand that Teasley has warned to his scheduled probation meetings. Well, police then arrested Teasley on Thursday. During his interrogation, he did initially say the man on the surveillance video was him, but then he recanted and said he wasn't sure anymore. Lieutenant James Hester with Phoenix's Police Homicide Division said on Friday at an afternoon press conference that Teasley didn't offer a motive. He also said that investigators believe Lauren was able to fend off Teasley during the quick and vicious attack. Remember, it only lasted about a minute and that she most likely successfully escaped, but that her injuries were too severe to recover from or to leave the scene. Now, court documents reveal that during the interrogation, investigators asked him if he intended to murder Lauren, and he told law enforcement he wasn't the kind of person that plans to kill another person. But if he was going to murder someone, it would be premeditated. Well, there's some irony here because Teasley did have a plane ticket for Detroit with him when he was arrested. And investigators also say it didn't appear that he even knew who Lauren was. Well, I had mentioned that they were able to preliminarily identify the blood as belonging to Teasley and that he had a probation officer. Well, that was because Teasley had served time for a 2021 armed robbery with a deadly weapon. He is now being held on a million dollar bond and will be back in court on May 15th. Let's take a moment to remember Lauren. Her mom described her as overly friendly and too trusting, but that they wouldn't trade that personality for anything because that's the person everyone loved. Her mother called her by the nickname Loey when she wrote this Facebook post. Although the arrest doesn't bring our Loey back and the journey ahead is sad and daunting, we are eternally grateful for the love and support we've received from the moment she went missing. Now, Lauren worked as an esthetician and her co-workers said they will always remember the laughter and smiles that Lauren brought to each of them. They also said her warmth and compassion made her not just a great esthetician, 
but a wonderful human being. All right, on to another case. Let's turn to an update on the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. And some of you may already know that I attended the trial on Friday. And I do have some unusual observations from being in court that day. But first, let's get you caught up on what happened in the trial in the past few days. And you know, I have to give this disclaimer. If you aren't familiar with this case, which is so complicated, go back and listen to the Rise and Crime update from last week that gives you a pretty good summary of this case that's out of Idaho that includes two dead children and two dead spouses and then a dead brother and some other dead people, but those are the main players right now. Okay, Thursday was, as always in this case, an eventful day that concluded with a hearing on Chad Day Bell's pending case. And let's start there. Chad has waived his right to a speedy trial, which caused a couple of things to happen. First, it severed Chad and Lori's cases because Lori wanted to go to trial quicker. Second, it means the date of Chad's trial can be pretty fluid, which is what we saw on Thursday. The attorneys decided that the trial couldn't be held in October, even though that was when it was set previously. They're expecting the trial to last 12 weeks, and they felt they couldn't require jurors to work through the holidays. So then the month of May was thrown around, but everyone finally settled on June of 2024. And yes, the wheels of justice do grind slowly. Okay, later in the day Thursday, several trial motions were argued. Former FBI agent Doug Hart worked on the Lori Vallow case from nearly the beginning of the investigation, and day two to be exact. And Hart has a couple of specialties that came into play in the investigation. He is extensively trained in burial sites of murdered victims. And that wasn't the issue for the defense. What they argued for more than an hour concerned Agent Hart's PowerPoint presentation of text messages retrieved from Lori's two iCloud accounts. Now, Hart is highly trained in this investigative work as well, but the defense feels that the presentation will take things out of context because all the texts won't be read. And they feel this might leave like gaps in information that will provide context to the concepts that were being discussed. Now, the prosecution assured that all the texts will be made available to the jury, but because of the massive amount of communication, the PowerPoint is needed to narrow the information to the most vital details. Okay, for example, the prosecution argued that jurors don't need to read texts about carpool pickups and soccer games. Well, Judge Boyce eventually ruled that the presentation would be admitted, and that's how court ended on Thursday. Well, Friday was the day I attended, and court resumed with Agent Hart on the stand. And during the PowerPoint presentation, we heard what some would call steamy text messages between Lori and Chad. One message referred to them showering together despite being in separate states. And that's weird. I get it. I know what you're thinking. The logical person might think they were FaceTiming while showering. And I don't believe that was what was happening. I think the messages refer to them showering together in a spiritual realm. And during this part of the testimony is when Lori became more animated with her lawyers. Now my takeaway is she wanted the idea to be clarified, like the idea of showering together in this spiritual way, clarified. But that isn't Agent Hart's scope on the stand. He's only there to just provide the text information. And he also shared texts that could infer that Alex, Lori, and Chad were planning the death of Charles Vallow and Tammy Daybell. Now, those messages are a little vague. They reference a time of evil being taken care of with Charles, and also that Alex needs to protect Lori from Charles. And the messages about Tammy's death refer to Chad saying that pretty soon, the people on this little blue globe will know of Chad's love for Lori. Now, the romance on whatever level, sexual, spiritual, who knows, it began early on in Lori and Chad meeting. References to her becoming Chad's wife were included in text messages from January of 2019. And remember, Tammy dies in the fall of 2019. Now, Agent Hart also showed text messages between Charles' two children and Lori, and she texted them the day 
after Alex shot Charles in what he claimed was self-defense. She coldly tells them their dad has died and that she doesn't have much detail. She then doesn't text them for three more days. The kids are left in the dark about their dad's death. They send messages begging Lori to answer and that they deserve to know what happened and if there will be a funeral. Lori isn't grieving during these three days. She is sending multiple texts with Chad discussing when she's going to meet up with him next. Now, the defense objected several times, saying the presentation isn't giving clarification to the actual text threads, but Judge Boyce overruled those objections. Now, Agent Hart referenced text messages from the Book of Mormon. Now, that's an ancient scriptural text from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and both Lori and Chad were members of that faith. And specifically, the reference was about a prophet from the book named Nephi. Now, Nephi was commanded by God to kill a leader named Laban. Well, texts between Alex and Lori have Lori saying to Alex that he is like Nephi and that so is she. Now, court ended on Friday with Agent Hart still on the stand, and it will resume today with more information from Hart about those iCloud accounts. All right, do you want my observations? All right, here they are. I tried to not have any preconceived ideas, if that's even possible, when I went to court on Friday. I was worried I would feel lots of evil from Lori, so I was trying to be just really calm. And I was surprised when I didn't feel that way. I was seated about 15 feet from the defense table. And when she entered the courtroom, I was pretty shocked by her physical appearance. She is very thin. I would say crossing the boundary into being unhealthy. Her hair is going gray and she has aged dramatically since those wedding pictures in Hawaii. She's very friendly and some might say flirtatious with her attorneys. I think this is just her personality with everyone. If you reference back to the Arizona case, and maybe you've seen that video, she was really friendly with the cops there too. I just think this is how she acts. She's also really active in her defense, always whispering to her defense attorneys. You might remember that I explained how she kind of scrunched down between her attorneys when she didn't like the testimony that was being presented. This is possible. She is teeny compared to her attorneys, and she can really use them to shield her if she wants to. I, of course, didn't hear anything from Lori because she's not testifying, but the vibe I was getting is she's not ashamed. And it'll be really interesting to watch what the defense argues when they get a chance this week to put on their case. And remember, Idaho does not have an insanity plea, just might have been suitable in this trial. Lori also had no supporters in the courtroom on Friday, and I believe that has been the case most days for her. I did chat with JJ's grandparents, the Woodcocks. They are tired, and every day brings new challenges for their emotions. Now this courtroom is expansive, much larger than I thought it was going to be. I'm not really sold on the idea that cameras in the courtroom would have been difficult for the prosecution in defense. Now, I do believe it would have created a like a circus-like atmosphere, but I also believe a camera could have been used from a high angle and that no factors of the trial would have been compromised, like not being able to view the attorney's notes or the computer screens. I just don't think that would have happened. Now, I did talk with one journalist who said the case is so complicated that some major outlets have scaled back their coverage. It's, it's just too much to explain in a short news hit. Now, the judge in the case just comes off as a really good guy, like the kind of guy you'd like to have a barbecue with. And all in all, the courtroom on Friday was very polite. I would guess it was different on the days of the horrific death photos, but it was really nice and cordial on Friday. I spoke to one woman who had attended 17 of the 23 days of the trial so far, and I asked her what she thought, and she said, without hesitation, she's guilty as hell. All right. The jury seemed attentive, and it's a pretty broad demographic makeup. The jury box is quite a distance from Lori. Remember I said this courtroom is huge. So if she utters something or she laughs or she reacts in any way, it's probably harder for the jurors to see those things. And of course, I'm going to keep you updated on this case. It's carrying on this week and probably another week after that. I, I think they'll probably receive the case. The jury will receive the case in about a week. All right, finally today. 
on Thursday, I told you about the grisly discovery a week ago of seven bodies on a property in Henrietta, Oklahoma. Remember, that's a small town of under 7,000 residents that's about 90 miles east of Oklahoma City. Well, here's the quick reminder of what led up to the discovery of those bodies. In the early morning hours of Monday, May 1st, police issued an Amber Alert for two teen girls who had been reported missing. 14-year-old Ivy Webster and 16-year-old Brittany Brewer were last heard from on Monday morning at 1.30. Ivy's mother said Ivy's Life 360 location had been turned off and she wasn't responding to calls or texts. I promised updates, so... Here's what you need to know now. According to media reports, we've learned that the two girls were planning on spending the night with 13-year-old Tiffany Guess. Now, Tiffany is the daughter of Holly Guess. In 2020, Holly married registered sex offender Jesse McFadden. The sleepover was happening at McFadden's rural property. Holly and her two other teen children, 17-year-old Riley and 15-year-old Michael, were also at the ranch on that Sunday evening. The two missing girls and Holly and her children were all found shot to death on the remote Henrietta property. McFadden was also dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. The 39-year-old McFadden was a registered sex offender with a 2004 conviction for first-degree rape. McFadden was released from prison in 2020, but he was due in court on that very Monday morning to stand trial for soliciting sexual communication with a minor using technology and also for possession or distribution of juvenile pornography. The alleged crime happened while he was imprisoned for that rape. Now, the bodies were discovered after police made a second visit to the McFadden property on that Monday, and it's unclear if either visit was prompted by the Amber Alert or by McFadden Miss missing his court date. Now, videos were released late last week showing handcuffs, bondage collars, and lubricant in the laundry room of the McFadden home, as well as sex toys in the primary bedroom where a chain was also affixed to the wall. And one more upsetting detail, a chain was also attached to the kitchen counter. Now, as this case moves forward, I'll keep you updated and kind of let you know where things land. All right, that's your Monday edition of Rise in Crime. Join me again on Thursday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.